Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. This is Rochelle Scouten, Development Director at the National Bicycle Dealers Association. Uh, and welcome to another of our super webinar series. We are excited to have one of our board members here with us today to share some of his experience with you. Um, John Robinson, he is president of Johnny Bella Bikes. Uh, and he, like I said, is a board member of the NBDA. We are so happy to have him here with us. Take it away, John. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Um, uh, again here, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of background. Uh, I am actually not an industry veteran. Uh, I've only been a bike shop owner for about three years now. Previously, I'd worked in other areas with the, the bike industry for about five, but I'm actually from the banking industry. And one of the last things I did was I went around the country and went to small banks of credit unions and showed them how that they can run their branches more efficiently. A lot of those tools that I learned, I've kind of applied to my own business as well. And some of these things have kind of come out of that to um, trying to make my show shop, a better shop, not just uh, financially, but also within our own community. So I opened Johnny Velo Bikes about three years ago, and it's a small shop. We're only about 1,350 square feet. Uh, but I plopped it right down in the middle of an area of about two miles where there are four other bike shops. And I did that because, number one, I was a, a resident of the community. But number two, I really saw a need that these bike shops weren't addressing. They were often kind of standoffish, um, often kind of talked down to customers, uh, and didn't operate in a very professional manner. Now, there are a number of shops within the Columbus area that I think do a great job. But within my community, I really felt it was underserved. And kind of as a testament to that, um, not even within a full year of uh, being in business, it was actually only 10 months, uh, I was nominated by three different people within our community as the business person of the year. So our community responded uh, greatly to the, the types of things that we were doing uh, from our shop. And some of these things I'm gonna go through today uh, are uh, kind of, uh, in essence, uh, some of our tips. Um, I also decided from not just a local perspective, but I also wanted to have an impact from a national perspective. And so last year I ran for and was elected to the MBDA uh, as a board member and uh, started in October of 2019. So kind of new to the industry, about three years, a uh, little different perspective, but um, also new to the board of the MBDA. So um, as we kind of go through these today too, um, I want to make people aware these are what work for my shop. They may not work for yours for some reason or another, but what I would challenge you to do is if one of these don't work, think about it in a different way and also continue to search out and look for tips and ideas through additional resources. Um, I will tell you a lot of these aren't my ideas um, in traveling in my previous job. Every time I had an opportunity to go in and meet a local bike shop or talk to the owner or take some pictures of the store, I did that because I wanted to learn about their business and what worked well for them. And so some of these things today are some of the things that I've learned uh, through different resources and have worked very well with my shop. So. That being said, we're going to go ahead and jump into our first tip, the Flat Tire Club. Uh, this was actually not my idea. It was actually done by Chris Zane, who owns uh, Zane Cycles, and you, I read about it in his book, Reinventing the Wheel. Basically, the Flat Tire Club is this. It's a one-time fee of $25 that we offer the customer the day they buy their bike. That's the only time they can get it. So the one-time fee includes the tube, the labor cost, and they get no wait service. So they don't have to drop their bike off and wait days or anything like that uh, to get their bike back. Um, we're gonna do it while they wait. Typically it's gonna take somewhere between five to 15 minutes, but it has two benefits to it that. First of all, it ties them to our shop for life because this is a lifetime flat tire club. As long as they own their bike, 
and are a member of the Flat Tire Club, they can bring it in and we will replace their flat tire for free. So it gives the customer ease of mind as well, but there's also a financial component too. So if you look at over on the right side there, uh, the numbers, it actually increases the margin by 2.8%, 8.6% on a $500 bike. I think everyone would like two to 3% margin point bump. 63% of our customers purchase it. That means they see a value in it. When we explain to them, hey, a flat tire is 23 to $25 anyhow, it's kind of a no-brainer to them. So they get this benefit. They get the, um, the ease of knowing that their uh, flat tires are going to be taken care of. And it has hardly any cost to us at all. I mean, we're looking at a hard cost of about $1.80 a tube. And the service, which I'm already paying the, the service people to be in the shop anyhow. But the other benefit of this is less than 1% of the people uh, a year use it. I'll just share a number for you. The first year we introduced this, we had 12 people come back in and redeem it. 12 people. That's like $25 in tubes. And we sold thousands in our first year. So it has a financial benefit to it as well. It ties your customer to the shop for the life of the shop as long as you're doing things good. And the customer views it as an overall benefit. So that's number one, the Flat Tire Club. Next is our sales checkout station. Now, I didn't say service check-in station. I said sales checkout station. And this is something that we kind of struggled with. Being a 1,350 square foot shop, we had an issue because uh, our service checkout station was to the right of our POS. And it would get kind of busy when people were coming in, dropping off bikes or you know picking them up. But when we had customers come up to the POS to purchase their bike, you know, where they're leaning it against the POS station, they're leaning it in against, you know, different um, accessory stands and things like that. And the bike would sometimes get knocked over, that sort of thing. So what I did was yeah, I, I created a sales checkout station. And you can't really see it very well here, but that station is right behind most of our accessories that we're going to install on a bike, our water bottle cages, our saddlebags, um, lights, bells, even tassels. Um, you're also going to notice, too, there is a pump at that station. And that pump uh, is what we use. So we're going to basically the way it works is we put the bike in the stand. And we say, you know, these water bottle cages here, this color would look really good. It popped, you know, with the, the other colors on your bike. Um, you know, we'll talk about lights. Hey, we'll install those while we're waiting. Um, Saddlebags and things like that. There's a checklist that we go down. And you can see in the uh, upper picture there, that's a checklist we actually go down. So saddlebags, what do you put in a saddlebag? Phone mounts, safety, lights, helmets, locks, and clothing. Um, all of those things kind of operate then as a way to increase our accessories. It's easier for us then to also verify the serial numbers on the bikes because they're in a stand. We can just turn this uh, bike right over and check the serial number. And while we're putting all of this stuff on, we're having a conversation. So I pull the tags off and I lay them just to the left of the register. And that person then is going to come in, and if we're not busy, they're actually going to ring up the customer using our sales leader cards, which I'll talk about on the next slide, and then ring up uh, the customer. So while I'm having a conversation with the customer, maybe talking about their PSI and going through that, I'm showing them how to operate a pump. So our pump sells, we sell tons of pumps because of this. We talk to the customer about what their PSI should be. And so this is just another way to continue to increase sales, increase the experience, and make us a little more efficient as a shop that's really kind of hamstringed into a small um, sales uh, floor space. Now, I kind of alluded to in the last slide too, sales leader cards. These have worked extremely well for us. And, you know, I've seen different versions of 
a, a leader card or a sales suggestion card in the past. Um, different programs have them automatically in that. Um, another book, Leading Out Retail by Donnie Perry, he kind of talked about these as well. I kind of adapted mine a little bit. So basically, uh, if you look at the upper right card there, you can see there's items that a customer might consider for their body and then items that they might consider for their bike. This is kind of standard. You're gonna have conversations with the customer as you're going through the sales process with them. But you also wanna let them know that when they're thinking about buying a bike, they need to allot some additional money to buy some of these things. Over on the right-hand side of that top card, you'll see the name, address, email, cell, and some legalese. Now, I asked my attorney originally to give me a legal waiver form and shrink it as much as he could. What he came back was a two-page waiver release. So basically, I took that two-page waiver release and uh, brought it down to, I think there's what, five or six bullet points there. Now, I know from a legal standpoint, that's probably not gonna hold up very well, but what it does is two things. That release uh, puts the customer on notice that, hey, I've signed a waiver. I've agreed that I'm gonna ride at my own risk and obey traffic laws and uh, know uh, the, the risks associated with a test ride. But at the bottom of that bullet point there, it says, I'm also allowing Johnny Vela Bikes to contact me. So what we do with that is a couple things. That front where their name address, that section over there, and then we also have the section about body and bike. There's actually, you can't see it here, but there's a preparation. And when we take that preparation off, and separate that release from the body and bike section, the back of that has notes. So if a customer test rides a bike or multiple bikes, our sales lead is gonna write down not only what bikes they rode, but what their sizes were for those bikes too. And if the customer then decides that they're not going to buy a bike today, we're gonna give them then the body and bike section which also on the bottom portion shows the bikes I'm interested in and our five-way promise as well as our contact info. So when a customer walks out of a shop, we've also written down, these are the, um, the make, the model, the size, and this model has, you know, Tiagra versus Claris on it, and here's the price. So they have a card that they can walk out, and if they're going to go to another shop, they've got something they can compare to and say, well, this one has Tiagra. The one you're showing me at the same price has Sora. Um, so that's kind of why we have that card. And then also there's all of our contact information there and why our five-way promise kind of stands out amongst other shops. You know, we've actually kind of modified that recently, but one of those things is a 90-day price match guarantee. So they can say to the other shop that they're going to, do you offer a 90-day price match guarantee? So there's a lot of benefits to that. Um, the other part is once we have that marketing information or that customer information, we'll do a couple things. So if a customer comes in and they're test riding some really high-end bikes, I might at the end of the day, just send them a text saying, hey, thanks for coming in. You know, I saw that you test rode, you know, a, a, a Live Langma or something like that. I hope you had a great experience. Please let me know if there's anything we can do or if there's any other bikes you're interested in. The other thing I can do is I can also email that to them. Now, if I don't hear from that customer, that customer doesn't come back in within a week or two, I'm gonna also market them and say, hey, look, we're gonna do, um, you know, we'd like to see it come back in. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Um, there's all different kinds of ways that we can market to them with that as well. So that's our sales leader card and that's worked out extremely well for us. The next tip is no more advertised or sales tag bike sales. And this, I is something that we, our first two years, didn't adhere to. 
we were doing all kinds of sales, Mother's Day sales, um, Pi Day sales, you know, Father's Day sales, Pi Day's 3.14, um, March 14th. But we were doing all different kinds of sales to get people in the store. And what I learned was I'm also paying advertising to get those people in the store. I'm buying Facebook ads. I'm buying Google ads. So after our second year of doing this, I took a look at our margins and I said, we can do better. So at the beginning of last year, um, we decided that we, this year, we weren't going to offer any more sales and any more advertised discounts. So I looked back just recently to kind of see how we did before COVID. And the first year that we were in business and offered these types of sales, or the second year that we were in business and offered these kind of sales, our margins were much, much lower. And so we decided, look, we're not going to do team sponsorships anymore. And we'll go into that a little more in this presentation. We're not going to do advertised sales. We're not going to pay for advertising for sales. And let's see how we do. And so what I did was I looked at from January 1st to March 15th, before the whole COVID thing happened. And what I saw was kind of astounding to me. We actually did $5,000 less in sales. Now, keep in mind, though, we had a sponsorship of a race team in the previous year. They bought all these bikes and everything like that. So almost doing the same number was great. But even though we had $5,000 less in sales, we were $11,000 more profitable because we weren't doing those types of discounts. The other thing is sales tax as well. Marking down because we're you know getting down towards the end of the year, that sort of thing. People come in the shop, you know, in November, December, and you kind of, hey, you know, what do you have left? What what do you have on sale? That sort of thing. And we've actually changed that too. We're not doing that anymore. Our bike is the MSRP of the year that we bought it. So if there is any reason that you can give me really to get rid of that bike faster, I'm open to it. I, I Granted, you can take the money and you can turn it around a little bit faster, but the customer doesn't expect, or the customer expects a discount. And if they walk in and they're looking around and they don't see sales tags, there is not a, a big difference in value between a 2019 and a 2020 bike. So there's no real need to discount the bikes 10, 20, 30%. Granted, everyone's going to have some strays out there. Like I had an Apple green bike for a while that was on my sales floor. But at one point it was 30% off and I couldn't sell it. People thought there was something wrong with it or thought it was a lesser value or it was one of the last ones. So no one else wanted it, but it was the color. What I did, I got rid of the sales tag and within a couple of weeks, uh, the bike sold. Now, I'm a firm believer in creating value over discounts. And here's some margin saving ways that I think can help uh, you instead of discounting a bike. So let's just do some quick math here. I have a $1,000 bike and I have a customer that wants a 10% discount. That's $100 that is coming out of my pocket. If I do a f offer them instead a free flat tire club, for example, which is a $25 value, and then I say, and by the way, you get lifetime flat fixes, it doesn't cost me anything not a dime until they come in with a flat tire, but they see number one, they're getting a, a $25 value. And number two, they're getting lifetime flat fixes. 50% um, off a helmet's another great one uh, with today's bike purchase. That doesn't cost me anything. Again, again, margins on helmets should be close to 50%. You buy a $50 helmet, you get it for $25 half off. My cost is $25. It doesn't cost me a dime, but it does if I offer you 10% off on that bike. 
Um, some other things that we kind of do to spur purchases too is we give them a free tube with a bag purchase, a saddlebag purchase, $30 saddlebag. Hey, if you buy the saddlebag, we're running a thing right now, we'll give you a $10 tube to put in it. Okay, great. Oh, and by the way, you're going to need tire levers and you're going to need, you know, an air pump and some of those other things, but it's another way to give value to the customer. Six to 12 months deferred interest. Uh, you know, I typically do six on higher end bikes. I may do 12, but that's another way that you can spur a customer and also increase sales because if they're going to be, you know, financing through Synchrony or Firm or some of these other companies, hey, let's get your bike, let's get your pump, let's get your helmet, let's get all your accessories now because it's all, you know, deferred interest for six or 12 months. And another thing that we do too is we do free water bottle cages uh, or a free water bottle uh, when you purchase two cages. Now, if I have a customer say, yeah, I'll go ahead and get two cages on it, I'm not going to say, well, we're running a special. If you buy two, you get a water bottle. But if I have a customer that says, I only want one, then I'll say, hey, look, if you get the second one, you get a free water bottle. Now, what I'm going to do to that person that bought two water bottle cages is instead, I'm going to create, create a thank you instead. So as they're on their way out their door, I'm going to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, here, let me give you a water bottle, too, so you can put it in that water bottle cage. And thank you for your business. So there's different ways that I can create value and not have to discount or discount where it's not going to be detrimental to my bank account. Another great thing that we do is tune up donations. And I love this. At first, I started just giving one tune up for anyone that asked me. Now I give two because I think a husband and a wife, they might have bikes that have been sitting in a basement or a garage for a while. This is a way to get them both to get their bikes into the shop. So it's a financial win-win. Um, customers almost always buy additional parts or stuff when they come in with their free um, tune-up. Now we do a $75 tune-up and anyone that asks me for a silent auction, local schools, church festivals, raffles, uh, at corporations for, you know, some charity or whatever, I give them two of these. It allows you also to choose the customers you want. So you can reach out to other organizations within your community and say, hey, look, next time you guys are doing a, a fundraiser, give me a call. I'd be more than happy to donate some of these items. Um, gives you a better ROI. Uh, monetary donations are expensive. And the example I'll use is we have a lot of high schools right around. I've got you know, two major high schools uh, within 300 yards of my shop. I get inundated for, will you be a sponsor for my sports team banner that's on the field or advertising in our program or an ad on our calendar that we're, you know, putting in local businesses. And I can't, do that it would cost me too much money so what i do instead is say hey look you know we don't purchase ads for sports teams or things like that but what we do do is i'd be more than happy to give you 150 dollars worth of tune-ups use them for a silent auction um use them for a raffle if you want to or anything like that um and if you want to go ahead and give me credit and put me on a, an ad or something like that on your calendar or whatever, great. If you don't have to, though, um, I just want to help support your local school or support your local team. So, again, it doesn't mean I have to turn anyone away and I'm, it's not going to hurt my pocketbook. Um, now, people will say, yeah, there's a cost to that $75 tune-up. And I would agree, but I would also agree that if you do a proper service check-in on those bikes when they come in, that $75 tune-up is never $75. Now, I'm not saying create, you know, things that need done or anything like that, but do things that do need done on the bike. Uh, for example, our $75 tune-up typically once the person has checked out, 
it's now $157. So we have thoroughly gone through that bike and shown them. And that brings us to our service check-in station. Um, this is the other side of our POS station. And you can see here, there's a picture of our checklist. You know, we go through tires, wheels, you know, bottom brackets, uh, hubs, things like that as well, chains. Um, but we don't want the customer leaving and then being surprised later. So everyone on our staff is trained to check through thoroughly every service bike that comes in. And what we wanna do is, first of all, we prioritize customer safety. We want to make sure even if they're coming in for just a brake adjustment or some cable tightening or something like that, that we're doing this every time the bike comes in. Um, it allows us to catch additional issues and it allows us to be more transparent to the customer as well. So you can take a look at the customer and show them their bike, show them with that CCT chain checker part tool there, just how far their chain has stretched and why it needs replaced. You can, while the bike's in the stand, let them feel the front forks as you spin that wheel and feel the vibrations and the grittiness and explain to them, this is why you need a hub overhaul. You can show them dry, water, dry rod on their tires all of these things, they're going to, number one, be more informed about bike maintenance. Number two, they're probably going to ask you how they can prevent it in the future. And number three, they leave there with a better education of how the bike works. Um, so all of those things are, are great things to do. I, I always remember uh, I became a lifelong uh, customer to my auto shop because every time I went in, they saved the broken parts and kind of showed me and explained to me why they broke and how it could be prevented in the future. We do the same thing. Uh, recently, we had a person come in and we showed them how bad their seal bearings were. Uh, after we replaced them, we gave them their old seal bearings and we said, spend those and see. And they couldn't believe uh, how gritty and you know vibrating those were compared to their bike now. Uh, but they appreciated learning about that. The other thing is that Park Tool Chain Checker has another benefit that a lot of people don't know. And again, this was something I, I saw on one of the Facebook mechanic forums. The other end of the Chain Checker tool, the one that doesn't have the sliding rule uh, with the chain stretch, if you actually insert that into the cogs of a cassette or freewheel, if the bottom of that, if that tool touches the bottom of that groove, then you know the chain, or I'm sorry, then you know the cassette or freewheel has been ground out enough that it needs to be replaced. Again, you can show the customer exactly why that then needs replaced. The next is becoming a cyclist reference point. And this is something that we went ahead and did. Over to the right there, you'll see a map. And this is a bike Clintonville map, courtesy of Johnny Vela Bikes. And what it has on it is it has our bike trail route, as well as our city developed a neighborhood bikeway that connected a lot of the residential streets to um, outlets for small businesses that took them specifically to small businesses. But what the city didn't do very well is uh, number one, they put signs up and they painted sharrows on the routes, but they didn't explain to anyone in our community how this all connects and works. And the map that they had online was multiple colored routes and things like that in phase one and phase two. It didn't really show where the businesses were or anything like that. So we saw a need. Let's consolidate that and make it easy to understand, readable. And let's pick some of our favorite businesses that are bike friendly, that have parking out front for bikes or um, are just good local businesses. And let's create a map to help with that. So 
this map here, uh, our first printing was a thousand copies. We had to do a second printing of another thousand copies within the first three months because uh, it was so popular. It was in over 25 different businesses when it, in our community and most were right at the business's POS station or at the front of their store. And we would go through and we refill these once a month. If there's any out, I send one of my employees out and they go visit these businesses and they refresh them. Now, here's the back of that. So, you know, we give suggestions too, things that you can do to ride your bike, brunch, haircut, go to the park, the library, a farmer's market, a friend's house, or of course, obviously our shop. And then it's color coded too by different services uh, as well. So it's small enough, it can fit in a back pocket, you can strap it to your bike. It's also laminated or uh, got a, a, a glossy print uh, on it so that uh, if it does get wet while you're riding, it's not gonna bleed or anything like that. So, um, you know, we've given out over 2,000 of these, and you know, sadly to say, with everything going on with COVID, we actually, um, our next printing, we're actually going to have to take off some of these local businesses, unfortunately. But this has been a great way. Uh, I can't tell you, I've had people come in and just specifically buy a bike from us because of this map, and uh, it's been a great tool. Uh, if you have someone that buys a bike from you and they're asking, they're new. Where's a safe place to ride? Here, take one of our maps. Uh, it, it's just been a great uh, success for us. And to be honest with you, the printing has cost me less than $500. I, I, I couldn't ask for anything better from an advertising standpoint. Now we talked a little bit about race teams before too. Yeah, you know, here's a picture of the Johnny Vela race team. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details about uh, our headaches with this, but, um, they do drain resources, at least they did for our shop. Uh, again, being a 1,350 square foot shop, we don't have a ton of room. They would love to hang out in the shop and talk and things like that. They created a bro atmosphere and they weren't really our target market. They weren't really bringing in a lot of additional sales or things of that nature. And when we looked at the resources and the time drain and the margins, it just didn't make sense to continue wanting to do this. So what we decided to do, and this was just for our shop. Other shops, hey, race teams may work great for you, and that, that's phenomenal, but it didn't work for our shop. So what we actually have done instead is we've actually picked brand ambassadors. So these are going to be different types of cyclists. Uh, I have some triathlete cyclists. I have a spin instructor that also cycles. Uh, that's an ambassador. And what we do is we try and choose people that are good stewards to not just our shop, but to the biking community. They're not going to be standoffish. They're going to be welcoming and open. And this right here is just a picture here of uh, one of our ambassadors. Her name's Mari. And Mari was actually a tri coach in Atlanta, moved to Columbus, Ohio, and has a passion for getting people involved in tries. And she approached us and said, hey, would you want me to do a, an educational series about that? And we said, hey, that's great. You know, we offer a discount on service. Um, and she comes in three, four times a year, and she does what we call Tri-Curious. And it's an introductory class for people that are interested in uh, becoming a triathlete or, or participating in a triathlon. Um, so Mari does these great, you know, tri-coach clinics. Um, I have a spin instructor that in the off-season comes in, and we do a thing called spun. And people bring in their trainers and we supply some trainers too. And they can also do that. She's been a, a great support uh, for our shop and she's one of our ambassadors. We also have non-cyclists be her ambassadors. Uh, we have a bike yoga program in the winter and fall season. And we bring a yoga instructor and we actually do yoga in our shop. People bring their own mats. It's called Vinyasa Vino and Velo. And at the end of it, we have kind of a social hour. People can have a, a drink of wine if they want to, or a beer or something like that. 
but it focuses on the core muscles of cyclists and working through them uh, with yoga. So these are a number of different ways that you can not take a huge hit on margin by sponsoring a team, but these people are gonna be ambassadors to your brand and also to the biking industry. Number nine, uh, offering the rides program and teach your staff how to sell it. Now, for those of you uh, that aren't familiar with rides, rides is a protection plan for bikes. Unlike some of the protection plans you may have been used to in the past, rides is a little different. Um, rides actually offers preventive maintenance built into their plans. And it's a scalable plan. You can do a two year or a three year and you can choose one up to six tune ups uh, within those plans. Um, and it was actually developed in uh, conjunction with the MBDA and you do have to be an MBDA member uh, in order to be able to offer the rights program right now. Um, but when I decided to do this, my staff fought me we don't want to do protection plans. We're not insurance salesmen, you know, blah, 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 that sort of thing. And what we did is we actually created a campaign and the campaign was, well, your washing machine has it. Why doesn't your bike? And to try and get people to think in those kinds of terms. Now, the main difference between a washing machine protection plan and a bike protection plan through rides is you get preventive maintenance, depending on how many, which plan you pick, you get our standard $75 tune-up uh, on an annual basis. So that's been a, a phenomenal thing, but still my staff kind of fought me on this and we brought rides in, they went through the training class and to, believe it or not, every single person at the end of that training class was hyped up and understood why it's a benefit to the customer. They didn't feel like they were pushing a plan on a customer that the customer wasn't going to use or need. They actually saw this plan covers preventive maintenance. It covers wear and tear on chains, for example, on a bike. And it, again, puts the customer at ease with that purchase of a bike, knowing that for the next two or three years, and then they can re-up after that, um, their ease of mind, they're gonna be covered if anything happens with that bike. Um, so that's rides. Now I, I will say this too, rides is a great way to increase your margins. And I just throw down an example here on a $999 bike. Um, that actually increased our margin points by over 3% on the sale of that bike. And when you factor in then that that customer has to come back and get that $75 tune up in year two and in year three, it increases the overall margin to seven and or over 10% by having the rides program in your shop. So my guys were skeptical they sell them left and right now. 43% of our customers actually buy this program now. And it's, it's just been phenomenal uh, way to use it. Now, number 10, uh, this is a little biased maybe of being a board member, um, but apply to be America's best bike shop and apply with the idea that you may or may not make it, but you're gonna learn from the process. And I think if anyone goes through this process, they're gonna learn things about their shop and their employees and how they manage people and how they interact with their customers and how they merchandise their shop and make their shop look good from the outside, the, uh, the exterior as well as the inside. They're going to learn things that they can enact in the future to be better. It also pushes your staff to be better because there's a secret shop component to this. So my staff kind of joked around, you know, um, 
they were on edge a little bit because they didn't know when we were going to have a secret shopper come in the shop. I told them it was going to happen. I explained to them, you know, we went through our training, our previous training. These are the things that we need to do. And um, they rose to the occasion. Now, I think once they found out, we actually did get our shopping score. They kind of had a sigh of relief, but it actually pushed them all. And they all came in every day. Um, knowing that today could be the day they potentially got a secret shop. Um, and again, it also reveals areas for improvement. So we didn't get a perfect score. We got close, but we didn't get a perfect score. But it taught me one of the reasons why we didn't get a perfect score was because we didn't ask or suggest additional sales of accessories. And that was something that I stood back and thought about, you know what, that's true. We're not always doing that. And we do need to, if a, someone comes in for a tube, hey, do you have tire levers? Hey, do you need a pump? Not just selling them the tube. And that was a learning experience for me. And then the tip I give you too is send out a press release if you win. Don't just accept the award and hang it up on a wall, but be proactive about it. Be proud of it. We were in online news th uh, programs uh, throughout local Columbus, uh, the local 614 magazine, our community newspaper printed a story about it. Um, we got all different kinds of press from it and customers were drawn to that. Hey, they would just come in and thank us. Hey, I heard you guys, you know, got this award. Great. Um, it's another way to entice people. If a person is looking to buy a bike and they see one store that has been named one of America's best bike shops in their marketing and their advertising, and they see another store that hasn't been, which shop do you think they're going to go to? And then lastly here, again, not all these are my ideas. Uh, very few are actually. Um, I'll, I'll steal anything I can to, to better my business. But um, these are a couple books that I would really recommend people read. I read these while I was writing my business plan. Uh, I've actually reread these uh, a couple uh, different times now. And what I found is every time I read through these, I pick something else out, something new is applying to how I'm managing my business that these books address. So it's almost like a refresher course. Um, you know, every year or so I go through and reread one of these books. Um, the other thing, too, is the National Bike Dealers Association. If you're not a member, please consider being a member. If you support our industry, our industry is going to support you. The MBDA has all kinds of resources. I used them when I was writing my business plan. I have used them when I'm looking at my financials. And I use them to learn more about our industry and how I can operate my business better. So between our P2 consultancy programs, um, the super webinars, our podcasts, there are all different kinds of resources that the MBDA does to support your shop and our industry. And this is just like public radio. You know, why haven't you joined yet? Consider doing it because they're doing great things to better our industry and we need to support that. That's pretty much it from my standpoint. Um, there's my name, contact information. If you guys have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Enjoy your ride at johnnyvellobikes.com. There's my cell number. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer anyone's questions or if you want to follow up. If you have any new tips that work for your shop, share them with me. I want to know them. Uh, they may not work for me. They may work for you, but if there's something out there I haven't thought of, hey, let me know. I'd be more than happy to, to learn from you. So uh, again, I want to thank everyone. And I'm going to kind of turn this over to uh, Rochelle right now. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think there was some great stuff in there. Uh, and yes, if you haven't joined the NBDA, uh, go to nbda.com. We have all of our benefits listed and you can sign up right there. Um, 
I don't see any questions coming through. If you do have questions uh, about anything that was said, uh, feel free to email John at his email there, or you can email us at info at nvda.com, and uh, we'll be happy to get back to you that way. So thank you, everyone, and thank you, John, and we'll wrap up. Thank you very much, guys.